Hey, a pleasant happy day, everybody, as we're here at the next installment of the JB and Steel Show, episode six, as we're here to bring you the latest and the greatest around the NFL, some NBA talk, NHL talk about the postponements and the return to play a little bit on the Winter Classic as well. Hopefully it still goes on as planned. And then we'll also do some World Juniors talk for y'all as well. But first and <laughs> foremost, I hope you all had a great holiday. Yeah. Uh, Steel, how are you? And how your holidays? Oh man, I'm doing great. I hope everybody else out there had a great and wonderful uh, Merry Christmas. How was yours, man? How was yours? Did you have a good one? Yeah, it was good. It was good for sure. Um, obviously, it was helped out the fact that Team USA was able to take care of business in their first game in the World Junior. So that yeah, it always makes holiday. it for a nice little Christmas, a day after Christmas present. Yeah, <clears> exactly. <throat> yeah, they were able to take care of Slovakia, where Chromiak. Uh, was the only guy that was able to get going for Slovakia, but uh, we'll get into that one uh, more later. But let's jump right into it as we start with uh, an impressive play, a guy that we thought would have more of these on the season, but an impressive play from Zach Wilson where it looked like he was going to go out of bounds. He deked the Jaguars' defense, then was able to run it all the way down the sideline um, for a touchdown. Uh, where that was a really impressive game breaker play by Zach Wilson, which is somebody that we thought coming into this season, you would have saw more of that from as a quarterback where these two teams are fighting for a draft pick, but it doesn't seem like either of them are fighting for a quarterback with that draft pick. It's more they're fighting for the best pick to fill out the rest of their team. Well, Zach Wilson definitely looked good in this game where the Jags started coming back in the end where Jaguars fans were starting to get worried because I think they wanted to get the pick where it was funny on Twitter reactions and stuff. This was the most pissed you ever seen a fan base for winning a football game. Yeah. Right. Like they, wait they either minute. fan huh? base wanted to win this game. <clears throat> they would yeah. much rather have the better pick. <clears throat> now I'm, I'm here to tell you now, I, I have been impressed by uh, what Zach Wilson has been able to do. Okay. To, to an extent. You know what I mean? It's like you have to kind of take a little – you have to sprinkle a little bit of the good and the bad in there. You know what I mean? So I want to see all these guys be successful. You know what I mean? I really do. Um, but, yeah, when you're, when you're, when you're fighting for the, for the first round draft pick, <laughs> it clearly is not going to be the quarterback for either of those teams. It clearly is not. They clearly need to bring other weapons and other to players. To also defensive yes. players in, depending who's yes. there on the board. Yeah. Yes! Well, well, for them, it'll, it'll be the top two or three, so anybody should be there on the board for them to be able to pick. And so, them. you know, at that point, you know, like, when you don't have to worry about picking your quarterback for your first-round draft pick, but you yet you still are going to get, like, a really high— A great one. Yeah. yeah, you know, like if a top five, you know what I mean? Like if you're getting a top five draft pick and you don't need a quarterback, like I don't know about you, but if I was a general manager, I would be trading up to try to get more of that flavor so you could get a better player. You know what I mean? Much better players. The higher you are of the draft, the high, you know what I mean? So I don't know. I, I, I think a team that kind of takes the pressure off. You know, because you already have the quarterback, so now you're, you you already know that you're rebuilding because you already have the quarterback that you got last season. So to speak, because you still got to hit the pick. Like, for yeah, example, yeah. Um, <clears throat> if the Eagles, like my team, which I would assume they will do if they make the postseason and will choose to keep Jalen Hurts, they have three picks in the first round. So if you suck at all three of them, that still doesn't help by the fact that you already have the <laughs> Right. Pick. So, so <laughs> right. you still... So you still have to hit on the picks, but uh, yeah. it doesn't give you the pressure of needing the biggest kahuna position on the offense and then right. an entire football roster, which is your quarterback. So uh, that right. definitely it alleviates the pressure from that standpoint. Right. Uh, so I definitely get what you're saying there. Well, now we have to get into somebody who's one of your favorite in the league, uh, Steele, which is the Cincinnati Bengals, Joe Burrow, going 37 for 46, 525 yards, four touchdowns to now 
uh, move the Ravens to seventh um, in the playoff spot as their playoff hopes are dwindling a little bit as time goes on here due to mostly their injuries. That was like their C team defense. Yeah, uh, Lamar hasn't been in. Uh, but Joe Burrow took advantage, and that's exactly what you want to see him do. And he had a MVP level performance this week. And I know how much you've been touting him on our first five episodes. So I'll turn it over to you to just talk about how impressive, even though it wasn't against their top level gunners, it was still impressive to take advantage as he should have uh, against the Ravens in this game. See, these are games that in the past Cincinnati would lose. Okay, seriously. You like you look in the you look at the schedule and you go, well, yeah, man, even though Baltimore is still kind of hurting, they're still pretty much a pretty decent team for the most part. They have a pretty good defense anyway, too. You know what I mean? But you drop 41 on Baltimore. You know what I mean? Uh, that's taken advantage of the situation for sure. I really feel that ever since Lewis left Cincinnati. And I never thought they were going to win anything with him. Just because well, he that, lasted too long. I don't that's what necessarily I mean. think because Marvin Lewis has since um, coached in some other aspects and been part of player development around the league and Agreed. such. So, yeah. so like, I feel like he is a guy that also, because of how long it lasted there, that's the reason he doesn't have another job right now. Where if he had, this, if he had the coaching track of a regular coach and they didn't just hang on to him yeah. for a an oblivion amount of time, basically, yeah. uh, it, it wouldn't have kind of looked the way it did with the like, well, he didn't get anything similarly to guys like Hugh Jackson that were hung on to for a bit longer. Like anybody that's hung on to too long, it gives a little bit more bad apples, I think, in the mouth of hiring them on the other side, which it shouldn't, but it's just kind of perception becomes reality type thing. Right. Like the next gig that Mike Tomlin's going to get is going to be retirement or something else i don't foresee him coaching anywhere else potentially I, it would depend on him I, I feel like other teams would probably be interested in my i know my other teams would be interested i mean teams are still interested in bill cower right the guy's already you know how many years removed from the game yeah anyway so every year there's always talk about hey bill cower could potentially be the coach of the <laughs> You know, that it's just like that stupid rumor that comes around every year. You well, know, it's I mean? because also now you have it more so since Gruden, who have obviously did not work out uh, for that multitudes of reasons. Um, but uh, you uh, have since he came back, people think people will come back now from years or from being away. So that that, that kind of uh, rose that yeah. in the social media spear i think to be talked about more as mm -hmm. well i'll tell you what one of the coaches i think that people should have on their radar is left which i and, agree yeah he's a top-notch offensive coordinator and also, also yeah eric the enemy is that who you were gonna say yeah i was gonna get the enemy yeah. the chief scott yeah um those guys should be head coaches i think I agree. Yeah, I, I think, well, one of them. Or get a shot at it anyway. One of them could be the head coach of your Steelers next year. If they do end up moving. <sighs> <laughs> Another could end up being the head coach of Jacksonville since they technically only have an interim right now. So, so all right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to rip this right off. I'm just going to follow in the footsteps of the great Lance Green from Hockey Writers Inc. And I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid right off. Since you said that, since you broached that subject, sorry, gather round the fire, everyone. Gabby is going to start spouting again. <laughs> All righty. After the game with the Steelers this past weekend, I can just say one word, disappointment. I can say another word. Because once you win a playoff spot coming into that game. And then mm, play, potentially, time... yeah. Potentially, no, yeah. I'm saying like going in once you're still in the seventh spot. Yeah, we were still, and then you fell, and then you fell out. We're of the in the spot. hunt. We're yeah. in the hunt. Whatever. So here's my take, and I'm gonna rip the bandaid off. I think that this organization needs to move some coaches. I think it's time. I think it's long been time. I get it. I understand. And, and and this is going to burn in so many ways, but I think it's time for Mr. T to go. I think it's time for Coach T to go. Uh, I, 
I think it's time for Butler to go. Okay. Um, I don't know about Matt Canada because this is only his first year doing it, but the other fact of the matter is, is this, you know, I saw this comment that says, well, how can you expect to coach with such horrible quarterbacks? How can you expect to coach with such horrible offensive line? How can you expect to coach a team that has such and such of this or such and such of that? Well, I look at it like this. You've been the coach there now for the last 15 years. You are solely responsible for every single player on that roster. Exception one being Ben Roethlisberger. You did not draft him. He was drafted by the predecessor. But every player on that team has either been drafted or brought in by you. So what do you mean you can't coach a team that has such a horrible offensive line, you are the one responsible for building that line. How can you not coach Obviously a team? Obviously, the GM has, him, like all the other upper management guys, have been put in the draft, but you would think someone that's been around that long with one team would also probably, at least in the last, let's say, seven to eight years, probably have a big impact on who they draft to. Maybe not in the first five years but or six years, but you would think, in the last handful of 15. Years. Since he's been there for 15 years, you would think in at least seven or eight of those 15 years, he's probably had a good You'd impact on who And the fact that he <clears throat> comes in as a defensive minded coach and, you know, won a Super Bowl as a defensive coordinator with Tampa Bay when John Gruden was the coach down there. I mean, look, I am not saying <clears throat> Coach Tomlin knows more about football than almost every single football person I know has forgotten. No, it's like your reef said about when uh, different coaches are <coughs> let go. It's not like you're saying they're a bad coach. It's just certain times a guy meets their timeline. Every coach has a timeline. We just talked about it with Marvin Lewis. And I brought up Hugh Jackson, who was the same uh, way <coughs> he went into Excuse a crap me, yeah. situation anyway. So you kind of knew there was going to be a timeline, Hugh, at least. But uh, every coach meets their timeline uh, where that that's just the way that the nature of the business and the nature of the beast that is the business works. So I, I and see, that's that's kind of where I'm at here. OK, the, I look at the players on the team and I look at the types of players that have been on the team historically. Let's face it, um, for the most part, Pittsburgh has remained relevant let's just let's go from 2016 okay from the time that the um from the time that the steel curtain was was born until 2016 minus a couple of years there for chuck knoll in the 80s and a couple of ups and down years with cow and a couple of up and down years for 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 uh for uh, Tomlin, Pittsburgh has been pretty much in the playoffs or in the championship game. Okay, you get where I'm coming from here, right? So for the most part, it's pretty much a birthright that Pittsburgh's going to be playing late in the wintertime. It's pretty much expected. And even this year with all the struggles where it really hasn't been, if you put all things together, hasn't been that great of a season all in all, you're still 7-7-1. and So you're still... You, you, like, like even th- that goes to that point too. That even in this type of a season, uh, you're still in the hunt, which is why when you had um like Duck Hodges back there and you were able to stay in a hunt, I think those are things that prolonged um just how Marvin Lewis did a couple things to prolong his stay in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. That prolonged Tomlin stay mm-hmm. in Pittsburgh because nobody has any business being 500. With no offense to Duck Hodges, but he's more of a running guy that just is a ridiculous athlete than he is a great quarterback yeah. um he, so uh he was able to actually um put together a playbook along with the oc with them i think those things extend your lifeline a little bit there's always reasons behind why that's the case but this year could end up being when they let him go and then some of the guys we mentioned left which be enemy and others could be options for the steelers they could be options for the jaguars as well 
because uh, the Jets, I think they will end up hanging on. They just brought in their coach to be part of the rebuild. Mm, I know yeah, I, I think, but, honestly, I think Leftwich is more going to go Jaguars because that's who drafted him. Go you back to the that, that would make sense. Yeah, team yeah. connection. Right. So that would make sense for him to go there. Unless if he thinks the only thing with Byron Leftwich on my mind, though, is two, Bruce Arians ain't getting young, though. So if Bruce Arians, like, you don't know, they might talk to each other where, like, if he says, hey, if we win another one this year, I'm probably just going to ride off into the sunset and, and decide to retire at that point, being I was already retired and only came back to Coach Tom Brady and in Tampa Bay that has beautiful beaches and has good weather. So, like, I think um, those things as well uh, might come into play where if he thinks he has a chance to be the Bucks coach, then he might end up hanging around. Um, which is probably also um, something that comes into play depending what Andy Reid decides to do with Eric Bieniemy. But Reid's hung on for so long there with Bieniemy that I think at this point Bieniemy would be ready to jump ship if he gets a good offer. And I really hope that it's going to be there at Kansas City. I really, you know, I think it's that time for Andy Reid to go to. I mean, depending. You know what I mean? Well, Kansas City's been good this year. They just haven't been the same offense. True, and they've had a lot of injuries and and everything. They've had a lot of injuries, and I also think they're. um, It's not like Andy Reid. He, I remember from his coaching days here, even when he called plays, he was one of those coaches that took big influence from whoever his OC was. Where I'm not even sure entirely what they're doing this year. If they have the the relationship of him even calling up the OC calls, or if it's the double uh, work where he was one of those guys that really relied on input a lot. But I feel like he's a guy that they probably could hang on to for a, a bit longer because I feel like the Chiefs are fine. They just haven't clicked on all cylinders, mostly because of offensive injuries and also – yeah, uh, it's just the way that the time. Yeah, goes. you know, I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, yeah, can have your. You're not going to be as good as we saw that Kansas City Chiefs team be the last two years, where they came into a little bit of a struggle this year. Their defense picked them up, and now they are mm-hmm. one of the better end to round out the season. So. I mean, plus the fact too that there's a lot of tape out there now on Mahomes, and a lot of people know about. See, like I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. So Pittsburgh. <laughs> decided that they weren't going to let Mahomes do any big plays against them. And so they decided to not rush him. And I'm sorry, but you're a team that leads the league in sacks. You had, I can count on one hand how many blitzes you had packaged for the game. Five. Okay. And basically, Mahomes just said, oh, so you're going to give me this? All right, I'll take it. And guess what? Whatever they were giving him was 21 points worth. I'm sorry, 23 points worth. Yeah, yeah, it was too conservative of defense. You want to pressure a quarterback like that because even in a season where he didn't start as hot, he still uh, – his problem this season has been turnovers a little bit. Nine, the nine fumbles – the fumbles have been an issue for Patty where – 13 interceptions is not even terrible for a quarterback when you have 33 touchdowns. You know. So, but but the fumbles have been one of the biggest issues for him. Well, he holds where, the ball like a loaf of bread out there, where, and he's where, just yeah, slinging he, it he, around. He's, and, he's one of those guys, I think, eventually that's something you learn as you grow and age in the league that eventually he'll end up tucking it a little bit more. I hope so. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he still is having a heck of a season for having yeah. a – down year, like what some people are considering not as good of a Mahomes year, just as people considered at times last season, Rodgers did not have as yeah. big a Rodgers year. They would look at his overall numbers and what he was able to do last year. Um, and then he's uh, doing solid again this season. But yeah. I think, um, again, the Chiefs are moving in the right direction. Their offense has been much better the second half of the season as it was in the first half. Their defense is something you wanted to see improve. If there was something you would say to the Chiefs team the last two years when they've been very successful, what did you want to see improve? That was their defense, and their defense has been huge this year. So I think that makes them even more dangerous going down the stretch. And yeah. the potential a Super Bowl contender in the playoffs because they're picking it up on both sides at the right time, and this is probably the best defensive team they had. And being oh, the number one seed. And yeah, 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 trust me, dude, I'm with you. I, look, we saw a clinic 
on Sunday, we saw a clinic from the Kansas City Chiefs. It was like watching, you know, them attriculating the ball down the field all game long. Every time they got the ball, they scored. Right? Every possession they had resulted in in points. You know what I'm saying? So when that and then and then when when the opposition gets the ball as many times and they only get this many points, that's never a good thing. You know what I'm saying? And nope. so I think Kansas City has been impressive as far as they handled some adversity at the beginning of the year. Uh, they're coming through it. I'll tell you who else I've been impressed with as well, too, is the Buffalo Bills. I mean, to quote the infamous saying, nobody circles the wagons. <laughs> right. But Bills, man, I, that, you know, I, to beat New England like that, the way they did, okay. That to me, I that was a statement game for them. Division lead. Yeah, that was that was a big win uh, game for the Bills. I agree. Uh, Josh Allen has got back to being Josh. Oh Allen. yeah, pivotal for them mm-hmm. uh, heading into the down stretch, um, where it definitely looks like the AFC uh, might end up having a very good realm of dangerous teams because even though they had they've been battling it without Henry. The Tennessee Titans are still second and have a chance for Derrick Henry if he comes back in the postseason. That's like Tampa getting Kucherov back in hockey with the uh, element he's able to perform. Um, and then you have the Bills, who are that dangerous of a team if guys come yeah. back at the right time. The Bengals, led by Joe Burrow, um, yeah. of course. So the the AFC, uh, definitely. And then you have the first-place Chiefs right now. Definitely has some dangerous uh, opponents to go after, that's for sure. And then even if, like, you have the surprise teams of we've seen the the Patriots are one of those teams that have been up and down because they started slow. Yeah, the Chiefs started the hot, too. then the Patriots mm-hmm. got hot, and then the uh, and then the um, the Bills um, slowed down when the Patriots got hot. Yeah, and then now it kind of balanced out again. Yeah, and the Bills were able to overtake them. So I think um, when it comes to those teams, those two teams have a chance to be dangerous if you get the Patriots that were the really good Patriots that looked like one of the better AFC teams in certain weeks this year and not the Patriots that looked like they did going up against one of the biggest games of the season. Well, the biggest game of the yeah, season. Oh, Phil, yeah. Where yeah, they no, I agree. Play. But the thing I like the most about Jones as a quarterback this far is when you hear him in the media availability, he's one of the more accountable young guys where as soon as they suck for a game, he immediately says, like, we need to First do better. Person. I think yep. Yada, yada, yada. And that's a very good thing to have uh, in a guy you're building around uh, moving forward because they're another team that whatever they get and whoever falls them in the first round, they're going to be building around the offensive and defensive components they already have and the quarterback they already have. They don't have to worry about Mm -hmm. And this is also not a draft. You want to be having to worry about that position. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because let's swing back over to the NFC now and say that that's kind of – I see a lot of that in in Jalen Hurts out of the the Eagles. He's – when when the Eagles are back there stinking it up, he's the first person to be like, hey, man, I need to play better. I I need to do better. I need to prepare better. We need to be better as a team. Like, I listen to those pressers. You know what I mean? Like – and, no, um, yeah, Jalen Hurts <clears throat> is a very good. Jake Hurts is a very good, accountable uh, quarterback. He has a very bland press conference, which people yeah, don't always yeah. love. But uh, <laughs> he does always yeah. hold himself accountable, and um, really does put the team to put the right words forward, moving forward whenever they have exactly. a down performance, and whenever they have a great performance, he showcases um, how Everybody good that else. they did. Yeah. Uh, but I think um, in that overall game. The thing for the Eels that has to happen a little bit moving forward is uh, Andrew and I talked about it when we did our recap of it, but against the Washington football team, you started slow, recovered after a bad first quarter. Against the Jets, a bad first quarter, uh, recovered. The Giants game, they just stuck overall uh, where they lost 13-7, to and then the Saints, they destroyed them in the first quarter. So, like, it's been some games this year where you just didn't get off to a good first quarter start, where then perseverance and resilience are the words we used in a, our recap of the Eagles with Andrew and I, okay, but that's, that's what hurts the show which are yeah, great yeah, characteristics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a football team that's now eight and seven, finally over 500 this year, those are great characteristics to have. But at the same time saying that, 
you can do that against Washington, the Jets, and the Giants. You can't come out that flat in a first quarter against, even depending who they're playing in the final week, if Dallas is still playing some decent people, you can't even do that against a Cowboys team. But you definitely can't do that against a certain opponent's in the postseason, because if the postseason were to enter now, the Eagles would actually end up playing two versus seven. So that would be the Dallas, um, the Dallas Cowboys, or no, not the wild card game, excuse me, would be the Dallas Cowboys, I think, versus the Philadelphia Eagles. I didn't mean to say this. I said the seating wrong, but the wild card game would be us versus the Cowboys, I think, as it says it right now, according to score, if the season ended the NFC wild right now, the battle. FC East, <clears throat> right. and that's kind of my point. You can't come out slow against a full-powered Cowboys mm-hmm. team, but minus that, the team has mm-hmm. been much better of late. So as I'm saying that or a negative, on a positive, the team's been much better of late. The reason they recovered is not only they committed to the run better and have led that to open the passing game, but also because Jonathan Gannon has finally committed a little bit more to pressuring on defense, particularly um, in this game, they really took advantage of an inexperienced Jake Fromm, got him knocked out yes. of the game for a yes. uh, very not-so-solid backup in Mike Lennon. Um, so they showcased the pressure. They did the pressure really well. Showcasing that more is something Jonathan Gannon was holding back too much on her, um, in the season thus I far up agree. to the last couple of weeks. And being able to do that, having the defense be better of late, and being able to have that perseverance and resilience is huge for this team. The only thing I would say on the side you have to improve on big time moving forward is the starch. Because like I said, if that is the wild card game, you can't you can't no. play Dallas to start a game. Dak Prescott, Zeke, and the rest of them, Cooper, everyone else are going to take advantage of you and pick you apart if you yeah. start a game fully against Dallas. And also, um, they're, they're a defense that will take advantage of you not being able to have as good of a start they, where if you make drops that go through your hands – they might be able to read it a little bit more for interceptions. They might be able to read your delayed plays that mm-hmm. you take too long to develop and you take too long to make the decisions. Mm-hmm. They can read that better than teams mm-hmm. like the New York Giants, mm-hmm. New York Jets. And when you start getting into postseason, you start getting into the Tampa Bays, you start getting into, you know, <clears throat> the Dallas Cowboys, the Arizonas, the Green Bays. The and I mean, I'll tell you what, uh, that Green Bay team, um, all right. Okay, uh, let's let's see what they got. Uh, would like to see see how that goes for Green Bay. I, I'm a little bit um, sad about Arizona uh, that they dropped two in a row now. Um, uh, Arizona has. Uh, they were yeah. at the at the top and they dropped two in a row, especially that Indianapolis game. But that was a good game I think by now Indianapolis. They set to play the ball. <clears throat> Yeah. If I had to pick, if that ends up the playoff matchup, I have to lean Bucks in that instance. For uh, all day. Season. Yeah, all day. Yeah. yeah, all day. All day on that. Um, but impressive season for Kyler Murray once again. Um, and also, how about an ex Steeler, James Conner, coming in um, and just being like the man there now? You know what I mean? So, all right. <clears throat> yeah, James Conner's the one that. Uh, pissed off a lot of people when it came to uh, fantasy owners because um, they thought I'm, I think it's Edmonds, right? Is there other, uh, their other back? Yeah. Chase Edmonds. A lot of people thought Chase Edmonds Mm -hmm. would be more of the featured back drafted him higher. And then James Uh Conner becomes the touchdown wizard uh, and then becomes their featured back all of a sudden after being the touchdown. So uh, those are just weird things, how fantasy works. And then in contrast, the people that picked up James Conner are jumping up and down. Uh, but I think the big thing for the Eagles moving forward, especially if they want to push into the playoff, Dallas likely on the final week, unless if they're able to contend for that top spot, probably won't have their top kahunas in. But if you play them in the first yeah. time in the playoffs, they will. So you got to get better starts. And I'm looking forward to seeing if that happens against Washington next week and then, of course, against Dallas in the final week uh, to see how this team is able to kind of put it together in the final two weeks, because it's been a much better of late. Four and one in your last five is fantastic. The only knock is you have to start a little bit better once you get to the playoffs. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to recover mm-hmm. as much. 
Unless if you're the Chiefs and you just have Patrick Mahomes yeah, right. <laughs> into, into recovering from a ridiculous, the one of the best playoff deficits. I think it was the best actually recovery of all time. So yeah. I mean, unless mm-hmm. if you have that, that doesn't happen often. We're on a three game win streak. It's moving in the right direction. You got to take advantage of Washington again. Uh, they're coming off of getting absolutely destroyed. Uh, so you got to continue to take advantage of Washington. That's twice now. And then, Dallas just crushed. Washington yeah. this year, man, dude, they hung what forty six points on them in the first game, and then fifty six. Yeah, right. This one, but <laughs> oh my yeah, gosh. I mean, the Eagles Ooh. are doing their thing. Um, I think in this um episode, though, we just about dissolved all of the NFL talk. As uh, now we yeah. can uh move into the NHL and how the NHL, of course, for people that did not know originally was thinking of coming back today but then they postponed that an extra day to the 28th uh which is then when they decided to come back and then they also announced that there is a couple extra postponements um as well um with the rest of the schedule yeah. release, as the postponements uh, for covid related reasons were columbus chicago on the 28th uh, pittsburgh and toronto and boston and ottawa on the 29th and then I just saw this update. Um, let me scroll back up here. The National Hockey League announced today due to COVID-related issues, the following three games have also been postponed. Wednesday, December yeah. 29th, yeah. Um, Chicago at Winnipeg, Dallas at Colorado, and Friday, December 31st, Colorado at Dallas. No mm-hmm. make updates for these games have yet to be announced for those individual um, games. So... Unfortunately, uh, there has been more postponements in the NHL as this has kind of been the new normal um, for the league as of late, where due to that being the new normal, the NHL decided to implement, which most teams are using. Uh, Tony and Drakis is a good AHL insider to follow if you want to follow taxi squad moves. Um, so uh, teams already like Wilkes-Barre, the Flyers have already called up some guys, Jerry Mayhew and others feel like Sandstrom to be part of the optional taxi squad. But yeah. what I do really like um, with the taxi squad this year is clubs will be permitted to assess a six players of the taxi squad, but all such assignments will be subject to waiver requirements, which isn't great for teams, but that's better for players because that means if you get one, if you're not playing somewhere, you might get claimed go somewhere you have a better chance of playing. But right. the big thing for you being able to actually play and not get stuffed on a taxi squad which was the worst logistical thing of taxi squad this year was some guys only play like five, three, four, two total games in the season. Yeah. yeah. You can only be on it for 20 cumulative days. So you have to rotate until the okay. all-star break. You can't just have guys, the same dudes on your taxi squad. And that I really like the waiver thing allows it to be, you have to be strategic. So it's, it's better for the players in that aspect because if you do call them up and then send them back down and they end up getting claimed, they might go somewhere they end up playing either in the AHL or NHL immediately. And then also you can only be on there for 20 days. So it allows more rotation, um, which I think is a good thing as well. And then players on the taxi squad will be permitted to travel and practice with the club. However, such players can only play in a game if recalled and placed on the active roster. And then usually there's a 5 PM deadline for whatever time zone you're in except for, like, I guess, extra circumstances um, when it comes to those players being on the taxi squad. And then they say all players are not required to travel, but they recommend that you obviously bring as much with you as possible. So if anything does happen, you have an adequate amount of players. Like, it seems like the Flyers are going to bring all three that they caught up in case yeah. they uh, feel like yeah. Sandstrom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with okay. them to Seattle if they do end up traveling to Seattle, as one example. All right, so... I'm going to also rip this Band-Aid off, too, and say that the NHL completely dropped the ball on this. They, they, they had an opportunity at the beginning of the season when they knew they were going to require players and everybody to get the shot, right? They should have 
kept the same protocols that they had the previous season so that there could be taxi squads and all that other stuff because well they talked about it on dang when steve dangle who i think does a pretty good job on uh, his podcast the one guy i'm blanking on his name it might be jesse but the guy that sits all the way to the right on there he made the point he was hearing from people he talked to the reason they didn't do that is for what I just said. It's not good for players. Taxes I understand fly. that. So I they understand that. To, they basically just went, let's hope for the best. And then if we have to amend the CBA, as we talked about in past things, when it came to baseball, you can amend things. That's what they did here. They amended the CBA in the temporary. Um, and, and they came to this um did this um, basically compromise here where coming into the season, I think the players association was a big pushback of guys don't want to be sitting, just sitting there, not playing games where they could have changed. Cause these, these no, new regulations, were not the regulations for last year's taxi squads where there was not the 20 cumulative days and all that, where that helps players having the waiver effects that helps players. If you put those in effect right away, then, yeah, you probably could have done it from the season jump. But at the same time, I think with the way that they everybody was vaccinated, they were thinking at that point things would have been better at, the, at, at this structure and you wouldn't have had as much of cancellations. And that's why they didn't want to harm players in terms of how many games they play by having to create the taxi squads in full effect again. Because as of right now, this is only temporary too. The taxi squads are only in effect until the all-star break for the current being. And then they're going to reassess um, at that moment. And then the taxi squads right now are set to dissolve right as teams go into the all-star break where you either can call up those players or send them down at that point And they would be subject to whatever waiver um, requirements are for that player. So I got you. I got you. So, like I said, you know, uh, I have my opinions about what things are and everything like that. But all we can do is just talk about what we see and what what's actually going on out there. You know what I mean? And uh, also, I, I really think they just kind of dropped it here a little bit. I I see that they're trying to make amends to it now. You know what I mean? And they're trying to be like uh, doing it on the fly, right? And so I get it. But I think that if they were going to go into this season with forcing everybody to get the shot to begin with, I, I think they should have they should have mandated a number of players that were going to be testing positive for the team and then the league was going to step in and start postponing games. I think they should have done that because they made one set of rules for oh, Ottawa, another that's set of rules for New York. I agree with that, but that's a <clears throat> different topic than the taxi squads because No, I agree, but that, 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 that yeah, that 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 they did drop the ball and they should have had a um instituted a guideline of how many guys you had to have before they went right into a so what i'm saying is, is they could have instituted of, that cba thing where they could have had the taxi squad guys and still had the rotational period and all that stuff because they would have known ahead of, or they would have seen or had foresight enough to know that hey we're forcing all these guys to get a shot um, I guarantee you it's going to come back around. Come on, are you kidding me? Whatever. And uh, uh, they, Well, I think, too, they might have thought, because in this release it doesn't seem like they're leaning towards from the language in the release, because uh, let me find the exact thing um, they said um, for this. It says, the health and safety of all players and club personnel remain the number one priority, and games will continue to be postponed to the extent health and safety concerns warrant. Now, obviously that's true in every league. But if you read the rest of it and the language of the release, if you want to go and read it, it makes it seem like the NHL is definitely not thinking of going towards the NFL protocols at this time, where I think part of it is the big thing you said yeah. for um, why they didn't institute the taxi squad is they got everybody vaccinated, where some leagues did not have as high of a vaccination rate. The, NFL, the NHL mandated everybody to get the shot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but and then the NBA eventually, I think, did something. But at first you you didn't have you. I think you were hoping for the best where you didn't need the taxi squads, because like I said, it just comes down to being as simple as players don't want to 
it's not a good thing for the players to have a taxi squad implemented. I agree. They wanted to hold off to as long as they possibly could implement. I agree. They, they were hoping the spread rate probably was not as good w- once you were vaccinated. And the other side of it, I think, is they were probably hoping Canada would bite at a certain point and let you have more lax regulations. I think personally, that was a side of it they thought going into where eventually Canada would bite on not being as damning with the regulations, basically, which at that point that hasn't happened. So uh, where no other league minus um, the uh, MLB with one team, but they don't have to worry about that for a while, even if they have a season. And then the NBA with one team that they could just move them and tell them to play in the U.S. like they did last year. The NHL obviously has a few teams in Canada, so they have to worry about that the most out of any league. I'm with you. I'm with you. So a total now of 70 games have been postponed, and I guess now it's basically going to be, well, hey, let's just postpone them all until the Winter Classic, and then – We'll let one game go, and then if that goes off, then we'll start putting more games out. Well, right now we are set to – there are supposed to be games. Yeah, well, on this, the 28th, Montreal, Tampa Bay, 7 o'clock, Vegas, L.A., 1030, Arizona, San Jose. San Jose, and then the other games postponed. Right, right. right. And, then, and then you have games scheduled now on the 29th. But I, I'm just not seeing it, man. I'm just – See, here's the thing. You well, the taxi squad was reintroduced. I feel like this will solve itself in time because the taxi squad in is, time. You're doing testing and you're having the guys there. That's reintroduced so you don't have to cancel most games. Because even if say six guys go on it that day, if you had the six guys come up from your taxi squad, the NHL they even said it in the release is doing this so you don't have to cancel as many games due to guys going out, like, basically the day of and and all that, which has led to many cancellations this year, day of positive. So they're hoping that doesn't basically become yeah. as an issue because you have six dudes on the right. taxi squad. That are <laughs> yeah, right. but, the, but the move I like the most is the goaltender thing that I think they really did a good job on protecting because – it says if should both goaltenders on a club's playing roster, I don't know why they use the word incapacitated, but it said become incapacitated during an NHL game, uh, the club will similarly be permitted to immediately recall a goaltender for purposes of playing in such game. So instead of having an e-bug, your taxi squad goaltender can immediately be activated along from that wording and then uh, be inserted into that game if both of your starters were to get injured. So they made a rule there to help teams out with the goaltender um, so they don't have to have, if the worst happens, have an, have an emergency back. And you don't have to worry about any one of the taxi squad players being a goaltender. You can have them count separately. Yeah, you don't have to worry about having, like, they have emergency catchers in baseball. Yeah, an emergency. Like, yeah, you don't yeah. Have to log an emergency goaltender. Yeah, yeah. Or something. And the other thing is if a club has fewer than two goaltenders on its active roster – who are able to play, um, it will be permitted to recall a goaltender immediately. So that would, again, be whoever um, is on minor that, league or whatever roster, yeah. um, which, like, as an example with the Flyers, that would be Sandstrom. I think it's Wall would be a guy that you would think would be that with the Toronto is another example. You could immediately recall those guys if needed okay. to be either starter or backup, whatever you want them to be for that game. Okay, I got you. Okay. Well, here we go. So, I mean, that's kind of what's going on with the NHL. Um, we got World Juniors have started. and Well, the one thing I think we should talk about in the positive before we move on to the World Juniors is as long as it's able to play a target field, the NHL, first of all, one more thing that the NHL has to do better at is advertising because things would be hyped up a lot more um, when it comes to around the league. <clears throat> If the NHL did not just advertise on its own network, and that was about it. Uh, so I think um, they need to do a lot better with that. But the Winter Classic this year um, is Minnesota and St. Louis in Target Field in Minnesota. Both of those teams are two of the um, roundhouse top-notch teams of the West. So it's going to be interesting. This is going to be a good game. Um, it's going to be interesting to be who's active. 
where Minnesota was the only team I saw Frank Cervalli tweet. I think it was yesterday, but they were not affected yet. Cross your fingers. But um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. But if that game's able to go on, that's going to be a very good winner. Classic. It's just a shame that the NHL doesn't really hype up these things as they should, whether it's the regular outdoor game, the Winter you Classic, the, um, the Tahoe game. Uh, that's the only one that was advertised a little better, but they still could have done much better. It's like they, it's like they try so hard to be mediocre. <laughs> you know what? I mean? Like they, they. It's like you would think that. Wait a minute. The NHL has this at their disposal. This at their disposal. They've got all this super huge amounts of money now being dumped into it from ESPN and all these other TV contract deals and all this other stuff. You would think that they would have a little bit more wherewithal to bring more professional people in to help market this a little better. I mean, is the sport growing? Yes. Could it be done better? Way better. Okay. Yeah. The, the winter well, classic is one of the most ultimate games that everybody on in the United States knows about and watches, right? Like, of all the hockey games that go off, there's two hockey games that people watch. It's the Winter Classic and the Stanley Cup. But they could care less about anything else that happens during the regular season or anything else. But they watch the Winter Classic, right? Because it's New Year's Day. What a great idea that was, right? To put it on New Year's Day. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean... I agree. The NHL, I think, though, I do think my one friend brought it up. They should stop putting games on New Year's Day. Before it used to just be the Winter Classic. That that made it more of a spectacle when you just had the Winter Classic on New Year's Day. Where I I see now why you have to do it because you're coming back from the COVID seasons and yada yada. But once the world goes back to more normalcy, there shouldn't be maybe if you want to do it outside of the time frame of the Winter Classic game put one or two others, but there should not be a truckload of games like there is this year once the world's back to normal on the same day as the Winter Classic. There should only be that game and maybe one or two other oh, games. Oh, yeah, no, I agree. On different TV slots. Uh, where, where it wasn't, that's not just because of COVID, though. My buddy um, Zach and I were talking about it. He did stuff for Nitty Gritty for some time where uh, that was before COVID. They started putting more games on New Year's Day the last few years. So I think they should go back to advertising it well, they never really advertised it good, so they should start advertising it good and go back to making it the main spectacle on New Year's Day, not having like Just seven one. other games. Well, or, what they would, or like yeah, what they were doing was called the Stadium Series. So they would have a game that would be not the Winter Classic. It didn't go off on uh, January 1st. It went off well, like, no, in February. They still beat the Stadium Series. I'm talking about they just shouldn't have regular games on New Year's Day. Oh. And if they do, should only be one game because the Winter Classic should be the main focus. And that one game should be outside of when the Winter Classic is happening. Because in recent years, they've had games on the same day as the Winter Classic. Where before oh, they, they did, it, it used to just be the Winter Classic. So I'm saying they should go back okay. to that. that, that yeah, no, that's a, I agree. Stadium series, I don't mind the Stadium Series. Some people think that dwindles down the Winter Classic. I personally don't think that's the case. I just think the Winter Classic is not as good because the NHL sucks at advertising it. Where if they could advertise both, it wouldn't be neither would be dwindled down. It would just be a better shown spectacle to more people because they actually advertise it. Okay, see, now I see what you're saying now. I looked on here. There's a full slate of games. Exactly. <laughs> right? Like, there's nothing special about that game, just the fact that it's outside. Big mm -hmm. deal. You got a full slate of games there. Yeah, I agree. They should have cuz let me look. There's only there's only it's a Saturday though, so that's the other thing too. Saturday there's usually a lot of full slate of games on Saturday. Um they've been they've been trying to front load the Friday games. Like there's been a there's been more Friday games this year than there has been in the past couple of years where Friday games have been kind of like sporadic where there's like only maybe like four or five where now they've been kind of loading them up now. And then Saturday there was like the full slate where every single team in the league was playing on Saturday. Right. That's what they were doing the last couple of years. Well, now I look on here. Yeah, they have a full slate of games. 
for for January 1st. That should not be the case. It should only be the St. Louis Minnesota game. That's it. Yeah, and then if you want to do like for example, our game is outside of the window because that's a later game. So you can do games outside of the Winter Classic window, but you shouldn't have games inside the same time window. That's my biggest thing. And you have Edmonton and Islanders at two o'clock. Nashville, Chicago, two o'clock. You, all these games are at one o'clock. Well, yeah, yeah. The Winter Classic, I know they started doing later because of ice conditions. That's why they started doing that. Where before they did used to do them earlier, but okay. Uh, but yeah. the fact that you got all these other games at one o'clock or two o'clock that are gonna, you know, that are. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. They should not. This is to me. This is no. Nah, see, I agree. I think they should just be the only one game on this night, this day. It should be the Winter Classic, and that's it. Or, yeah. like you said, outside the window. Where the a lot of the games are outside the window, but I don't know why they have Toronto and Ottawa playing at the same time as the Winter Classic. Like that game makes no sense to me, scheduling wise. Why they would have that play at the same time? But right. anyway. Let's move on now to round up this show in some very good hockey talk involving the IIHF as we talk about the World Juniors this far. As also an interesting thing, the council decided on Sunday that, same as last year, the same 10 teams in the top division will return in order to, as they said, to safeguard the sport of integrity of the competition in light of the extraordinary COVID-related circumstances. But Belarus, who owned promotion, interestingly, in the lesser division will still take part in next year's tournament. However, that will make the tournament then be an 11 team tournament at the current juncture instead of a 10 team tournament. So that will change things around a little bit. The thinking is maybe they'll take both top teams from the lower division eventually. And yeah, maybe 12 makes more sense than an odd number yeah. 11 teams. Yeah. Uh, Gord Miller brought that up on a broadcast yesterday and I agree with them. It wouldn't make a heck of a lot of sense. You only have 11 teams. But 12 uh, would work out well. But this far um, in the World Juniors, uh, you had Finland take care of Germany 3-1, uh, to one, where in uh, that game, uh, Nikita Kwap, uh, Germany's goaltender, was huge uh, for being able to even keep them in that game, <laughs> uh, where, where he was the big reason uh, they were able to uh, stay in this game as a whole. And then Finland was able to score thanks to uh, Samuel Hellenius, who is a, a Kings prospect, being able to get a couple goals. And then Joel Mata, who was able to get one on a rebound. And then one of Pirlo's future good friends, Luca Musenberger. <laughs> prospect, I knew you were going to uh, pick him. I knew it. An Edmonton Oilers prospect yeah. uh, for Germany was able to pot one as Alexander Blank. I don't know what he was thinking. Yeah, Blank, meaning a different word, is something you could use for what he was thinking going through three people. But it ended up working as it went back to Busenberger for the goal, and uh, he was able to pot it in uh, the Oilers prospect there, where uh, Mata is at the University of Vermont, who I, who is eligible for this year's draft. Yep. So definitely mm-hmm. keep eyes on uh, mm-hmm. for, th- for this year's draft. Uh, Yo Mata is already playing in North American hockey, um, which is usually rises you a little bit in the draft stocks because you don't have that, it, which is not a huge thing because, like Sam Costantino said, playing well in the league tends to translate well, but already playing on North America just gives you that little bit extra spice True. Uh, to it. But Holinas was the star um, of this game, obviously, being able to capture two goals. And then also Brad Lambert, which is big because he was struggling early in his league this season, was able to have two assists. He did good. We'll get to this game in a minute. But he did good in Finland's game today as well. But he was able to have pot two assists in this game, which is huge for the draft stock because he's obviously been struggling a bit, but still is projected as a high first-round talent, as he should be, because you see the skill and silky hands, the passing, the skating. Oh, yeah. And all the playmaking ability and shooting. He's another guy that doesn't need a shot if he's open. He dislikes. So uh, he's a guy that this is really going to help him out if he showcases himself wildly in this tournament. And then he can probably have a hot stretch in the back half of the Liga season after that. Yeah. Best. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that for sure. And been impressive, I have to say. Been impressive. Um, there, 
not playing as many games because they didn't have the um, the warm up games. They usually have two. They had one. They had one. Switzerland, uh, I think, was supposed to play Czechnia. Yeah, I think so. And that's who got postponed because yeah. Switzerland had COVID right. uh, issues affecting them. Okay. So, um, United States t- took care of their team. Canada took care yeah. of their team. And then Nikita um, Kwap, by the way, he's uh, as if Carolina. Um, maybe he's the reason why Carolina got rid of a. Uh, What's his name? Nedeljkovic. Uh, do Nikita you think Kwap maybe? Is a Carolina uh, prospect for Germany. Yeah, dude, I think so. He's only 18 years old, uh, having great success. So you wondered why at the time, we all wondered why, including us at the time, of why they would move on and bring in two veterans. It's just working out swimmingly because Anderson's one of the best goalies in the league. But that could be the reason why uh, that was the case. Mm-hmm. But, um, we also, before we go to, we'll save the U.S. one for uh, last when we get to that, because that's our, our team. But before we go to that, I do have to point out, for our Flyers fans, Flyers prospect Emil Andrea had a very good game. Yes, uh, he did. Sweden, who was the captain for Team Sweden, by the way. And then exactly. Oscar Olsen, who is Colorado's prospect, as if they need more goal-scoring talent, uh, was able to snipe one um, in this game as well. And then Simon Edvinson, one of Detroit's top prospects was able to get one on a nice breakaway shorthanded nonetheless that he was able to score on. And then Alexander Holtz, who's already saw some time with the devils goes over yep. and had success being able to pot a um, wrist shot one time, or one of those weird where you just fire it right away, wish wrist shot one timers. And then Theodore Niederbach, uh, that, that goal should have been saved, but uh, it wasn't, it ended up getting through the wickets and Niederbach, the face off wizard, uh, was able to score, then Jungman added the uh, empty net goal. But minus the fact that Andrea played great and Simon Edmondson played great um, back there in this game for Sweden, you have to point out the guy that is supposed to be one of the top picks in 2023, Matvei Mishkov, uh, was huge in this game. Got a lucky goal as the one they ruled that it, um yeah. because the defender pushed him into the goaltender, the yeah. net allowed his moorings and um th- th- that allowed the goal but uh he looked good around the ice in general really generating a lot of offense the entire night and then being able to have a couple fortunate plays for him due to his good play fall in his favor later in the game where uh then he has one that he's able to bank off of a, um one of the uh swedes there and be able to get it to go off of the back of the goal stander well step and into the net so uh, it, obviously, sometimes you need a little bit of luck, uh, just as you need skill. But the sometimes. most interesting thing, I would say, Mishkov for Russia was definitely a player of the game, and then Andrea and Edvinson on defense. Yeah, I'd have to uh, agree. Players of the game, um, for Sweden. But the interesting thing in this game is, I didn't even think when they took him out, Oskarov looked that bad. I thought they just took him out for Gushkov, and then they put Gushkov in again today which the announcer for that game disagreed with, and I kind of agree with, because there's nothing against Yigur Gushkov. It's just Askarov hasn't been great. It's been mediocre would be the word to use in what he's looked in World Juniors compared to every other play he's been in in his career this far. But in that particular game, uh, you had goals on a wide-open play by Olsen. You had a terrible yeah. turnover. Yeah. Edmondson. And then you had Andre have a perfect play. He slid the line with another top-notch defenseman, Helge Granz. Exactly. Uh, and was able to then wait for his player. I can't remember who it was in front, but he screened the goaltender and fired it at the perfect time. Mm-hmm. I don't put those goals on Askarov. I, I feel like that might have been more of a, by Sergei Zuboff, NHL Hall of Famer, by the way, uh, mm-hmm. was more of a let me try to pump up my team type move. But then at the same time, I don't know why he would have kept the same – decision today but that's a different story uh for a different time this was a very good game between uh sweden and russia i agree where, where um sweden showed having their coach back who was out through the COVID protocols last year um that they are a team to really be reckoned with this year where it's been a while since they won they haven't won since 2012 where it's been finland u.s or canada ever since but all have three uh, championships since then. Right. We'll so see. they showed that they really are a team to be reckoned with. We'll this see. Year. We'll see. They're going to play Slovakia tonight. First game. Um, uh, Sweden is, right? Yes. Yeah, Sweden played Slovakia in the last game of the night as we're recording. Uh, Czechnia 
uh, is just facing off against Germany. Germany, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Russia beats Switzerland. Uh, Brian Zanetti of the Philadelphia Flyers team, uh, four to two. As uh, we will get to that game, um, in a quick second. But check me on Canada as I talked about Pirlo's teams before. This is Pirlo and Payton's uh, team, uh, Team Canada. As Mason McTavish started the scoring. And then a little bit of a breakdown for Team Canada in the middle of the first period from 7.42 to about the 13-minute mark. As Michael Gooch scored on a give-and-go, Pavel Novak scored on a very good one-timer by Novak. I know, that was really nice. Yeah, that was a nice one-timer there, kind of like a little um, Philippe Forsberg type. Uh, one yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that was like textbook. Uh, that's a textbook one-timer right there, folks. And then Stanislav... Sposil made an absolutely ridiculous move around Olin Zellweger, who got it back later with a goal, but made a ridiculous move around Olin Zellweger uh, to be able to score when he went through his own left and was able to get it top yeah. shelf for uh, Dylan Garand there. Uh, that was a yeah. brilliant move. I thought Jacob Malik, uh, I, I didn't think uh, he looked too fantastic in this game. I thought he looked all right early, but then I thought the Czechnia goaltender um, definitely struggled a little bit in this game where, I mean, obviously it's fine. It's early um, in the tournament. He can rebound, but I think he's going to want to obviously have a much better um, affair in this next game where I believe Jacob Malik, if I'm not mistaken, is a devil's prospect. Oh, I don't, I, I some, I'm not sure. Yeah. And I'll double check that in a second, but I believe he's the devil's one. McTavish, who scored the very fine goal himself is, of course, the Ducks. Power, who scored the hat trick, he's obviously the player of this game. Uh, yeah. Owen Power, Whew, a good timer, a good rebound goal. Um, Donovan Zabrango had another good goal in this game, but the player of this game is Owen Power, hands down. And then I also, when I did the recap for this game, gave Zellweger a player of the game, too, because I thought he looked great on the Yeah, that's good, yeah. You get like, if you have that one play happen to you as a kid, sometimes that screws you where he didn't have that happen, where he just showed how good he is to be able to just bounce right back from that and be able to pot a goal later in the game. And uh, th that's a very fortunate uh, thing to see for that kid who's a Ducks prospect, so one of uh, Anthony Ciardelli. Yeah. Oh, man. I'll tell you um, what, that so Ducks team is stacked, team dude. Jeez. Oh, yeah, they're going to be stacked for the future. The Kings have a boatload of prospects in this World Juniors as well. Oh, yeah. uh, the California teams, even San Jose has a bunch of – the California teams in general have a boatload of prospects um, in this World Junior tournament as a whole. Um, Eklund obviously being the premier from uh, San Jose there. Yeah, uh, For yeah. San Jose and being the premier guy um, from Anaheim. And then you just have a, a multitude of guys um, from – from the uh, L.A. Kings, where there's two of them on on Finland alone. So exactly. uh, I think uh, I think this uh, tournament is full of just showing how good teams that are having a surprise season, the Ducks, the Kings having a solid season, the Sharks having a solid season, how much better these teams are going to be as time goes on as well out there for California hockey fans. That's for exactly. sure. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but now we are at um, the U.S. and Slovakia, which um, – Speaking of the L.A. Kings, um, Martin uh, Kromiak uh, is also a Kings prospect who was able to pot both goals um, for Slovakia in this game as he was picked in the fifth round. So how about yeah. that? You might get one of the um, – Lance brought up – I can't remember who he brought up in your podcast, but he brought up somebody when it came to a Giroud trade. That was a really good goal scorer from the fifth round for some team. Um, oh, I can't, I can't think. I can't recall. I can't recall who it was, but Martin Kromiak is another example of um, a guy that looks like he has a chance, has an absolute killer shot. Uh, not just just two goals we saw with his absolutely killer shot, being able to have a one time goal and another just very good one, and then just missed tying the game at the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spot and was just by far uh, the most like extravagantly standout player on the ice for Slovakia. Uh, Kromiak looks like he's going to be a fifth round steal yep. with the way he's developing uh, in, in his play this season and now in his play in the world juniors. Um, he looks like he has not just one of the best shots, but one of the better playmaking abilities yep. where yep. 
uh, the kings are going to continue. The the wealth get the wealthy get wealthier when it comes to those California teams. They're doing good picking their prospects of late, especially the Kings and the Ducks and um, Chromiak. Two years. He's a big part of uh, them moving forward. Um, where then in this game, otherwise Matthew Nyes, um, who was kind of from another former Matthews uh, spot. Uh, which was Matthew Boldy was able to score in the power play, assisted by Logan Cooley, who's one of the top guys in this year's draft, who I thought had a very good game and established himself in the faceoff dot well, um, was able to set up teammates well. Guys that, other than uh, Nyes, uh, guys did not finish on his other setups, but I thought he looked good otherwise. And then Mackie Somaskevich, I mean, that, sh- that that wrist shot was a Alexander Ovechkin um Level wrist shot. I don't know if you saw that wrist shot by uh, Semaskevich yesterday, but that yes, I he did. That um in the top corner of uh, past Simon Lakotsi um there where uh, Semaskevich uh, definitely uh, has a chance to be one of the more impressive goal scorers. As if Florida needs any more goal scoring talent, uh, the Florida Panthers have Mackie Semaskevich. Yeah, right. Play. Yeah, no. <laughs> but in the, in the system. Where uh, Matthew Nyes, who scored the first goal, was coming up Toronto's system as they can add even more talent and a guy that has a little bit of spunk as a bigger yeah. guy uh, as him. well um, to his game. Where Simon Lacozzi is showcasing himself really well, though, he actually did win the Clark Cup in the USHL um, with the steal over, actually, oddly enough, Jack Pert. Um, so, right. Right. Uh, I think he's pr- showing himself to be able to get drafted and picked up by an NHL roster. I think he was a player of the game to keep Slovakia in this game for them, their goaltender. Otherwise, um, Martin Chromiak wouldn't have had a chance. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a 3-2 game if it wasn't for Simon (laughs) Lekosi, who is really uh, showcasing himself to the world to be able to be a guy that gets drafted and then potentially works his way up. Works his way up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you, man. I'm with you for sure. Well, Joe, man, I'll tell you what. I think we put together another uh, another really good one here, man. Volume 6, what do you think, man? Uh, we, we got to cover a lot of the things. Now, look, I know that, you know, there's um, the NHL has kind of stopped and everything well, like that. Before we jump real quick, I did want to point out Daniel Danila Yurov, who's a very good two-way player who has already been talked about um, when it comes to this coming NHL draft. Uh, he was able to pot today. Uh, he potted one of Russia's goals. So that's a good thing for him moving forward because he's kind of had one of those. Um, I think a best way to put it is kind of just plateau starts to a season where you would want to see more from him, but you know he has a lot more. That's why he's still respected as like by some, even a top 10, others a top 15 potential. Uh, a guy that probably Kakalainen will end up picking. Uh, but um, <laughs> you, you have um, you have a guy that's able to pot a goal, and similarly to Lambert, they've had kind of plateau seasons in their seasons this season. If they can have a very good success in the tournament, that's going to continue to help them in their draft ranks and help to put the minds at ease of people that are going, we still really believe in these kids, but they're not showing it as much as we thought they were going to at the current juncture. So I think uh, he's an important guy with keen success. To yeah, I agree. Out because I agree. Some people were kind of starting to say with the way he was ranked high, uh, where's that going to go? And then Hellenius, uh, another Kings prospect today, was a big part of Finland's win as well. And so was Brad Lambert being able to pot a goal at the end of that game again. Um, and then Toppy Nimala, one of the best defensive prospects in hockey, was able to pot a goal as well as Casper yeah. Seaman Heibel, who also is a Kings prospect. So again, uh, the Kings Let's um, get are definitely doing a good job there at picking other guys throughout the entire draft and particularly from Finland. Uh, exactly. So <laughs> I, we do thank you all, though, and really hope you had a great, blessed and well Christmas and holiday season and continue to have a blessed and well Happy New Year. As uh, you can obviously find Steel Flyers at Steel Flyers 52 on Twitter and on the wonderful SteelFlyers.com. As you can find me at JJ Borick 26 on Twitter, as well as on SteelFlyers.com, writing for Flyers Nitty Gritty and on my Sports Fanatic News YouTube page, where we also post this, the raw edition of it, where all the bells and whistles are up on the great Steel Flyers channel. Definitely subscribe over there to Steel, as well as to, of course, Pure Low Wisdom, Pain on the Radio. 
and Off the Wall Hockey and Hockey Writers Inc., which is on Steel Flyers channel. So subscribe there and you will get that show. Thank you all very much for watching. Thank you, Pro Joe, for all the things you do, all the information that you have, man. There's so much we barely can pack it in. <laughs> it's like we we overstuff the show because there's so much Joe knows. Ah, what do you know? Uh, but if you guys aren't following Joe, you guys better be following him, man. He definitely uh, is the man in the know. So definitely check him out. Check out all his great articles on the flyersnittygritty.com and all the great stuff he does for the Reading Royals and, and all the stuff that he does for the Phantoms and everything else like that too. So check out Joe and for sure check out everything at the steelflyers.com, all sports network. We'll catch you all on the next volume of the JB and Steel Show.